This quote is important. How do you feel reading that? Do you agree with it? Do you disagree with it? We have some agreement. We have some agreement here. Any, anybody else? Did you agree? What does it mean when we talk about risk and what does that look like? Let's explore that some. Language is the foundation of all of our development. It has a ripple effect. Our development, all parts of ourselves, who we are and how we function in the world, language affects all of it. So it's not just one aspect of our life, it's everything about who we are as human beings in the world. Who we are as people. So when language is disrupted, it has an effect across all domains of our life and across our entire lifespan, it affects everything. So the concern about not having language or not having enough language comes from this widespread effect. Peter has a better uh, diagram for this, but I, I simplified it for our case. Now, language deprivation doesn't affect everyone. What we're talking about in this red line is some people grow up in native deaf environments, whether they're implanted or not, and it's very effective for them. There are deaf kids who grow up uh, signing, uh, and they have no language deprivation. But for everybody in the middle, when an implant is not 100% effective or when uh, exposure to sign language is delayed, that's where we see this effect. And those are the people that I'm concerned about. I, does that make sense? Okay. When Dr. Jess asked me to give this talk, she said, we want to know about your journey as a, as a scientist, how I got to language deprivation. And I thought, well, how do I explain that? And I realized I really can't tell my own story without telling the context I was born into. Because all that's happened historically before I was ever born had a huge impact on me. So there, I, I was it, born into this context that was critical for my own development. So let me just touch on a few items, and most of you will probably already know all these things, but I think it's important for us to set this context as I tell you more about myself. Most people know about the Milan Conference. Prior to the Milan Conference, it's, we commonly call that period a golden age for deaf education. Why was it called a golden age? Anybody? No one knows? That can't be. Yes, say that again, please. Yeah. The language of the education system was sign language prior to this time. Deaf people grew up within the system and became teachers in that system and passed on the language and culture of deaf people through schools for the deaf. It was a great time. And then we had the Milan Conference. Milan Conference is where uh, a change in deaf education was established and a ban on sign language was put in place in deaf education. And we often look at that as deaf disempowerment began at the Milan Conference. Our decision making was taken out of the equation. Our wisdom about the best way to teach deaf children was systematically removed from, the, from everything related to deaf education. So that's where the community often goes back to to say this is where the trouble started. These are quotes from that period of time where oralism started, well, became the dominant force in deaf education. Speech. How can you even ask how it's important? It's the value of life itself. This was the belief. Eugenics. People believed that if deaf people married and had kids, they would have deaf kids and there would be more, um, more and more deaf people and it would create a deaf class of people. 
a class that was separate from the rest of, the, of society. So we see ling uh, language discrimination beginning there. So can you guess who all these quotes are from? They're all from one person. Alexander Graham Bell. So probably the most hated hearing person in the deaf community, I would venture a guess, possibly. The principles that he supported were uh, to systematically rid the world of sign language. This book, The Deaf Mute Howls, have any of you heard of that book? Do other people know about that book? So I have a colleague who told me about this book. I had not heard of it. And one of the themes in that, in that book, and it's clear, was that deaf people have an internal sense because of their experience, not only with themselves, but with their community, that they see these effects of language deprivation and in the 1930s when this book was written this person talked about how he felt not having full access to that part of his brain where language should have developed he knew somehow he knew he could see his own gaps and somehow he knew it was connected to his brain development he knew that was involved that was 1930 this these ideas were published now obviously everyone probably knows in the 1960s was the beginning of ASL being legitimized as an actual language. But it's interesting that prior to that time, people were signing fluently and deaf already knew it intuitively that it was a language. They were using it. They were teaching with it. The, the wisdom was there intuitively, but it took a hearing person to legitimize it for the rest of the world. So in 1960, Deaf people already knew that ASL was a language, but once it, I mean, this was mind-blowing for so many people who never thought to ask this question in the first place, is ASL language, when it became clear that it was yes. and is. In 1968, I think this is an interesting, a little bit of a side point, maybe, but the Bilingual Education Act was passed, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. Are you? You're aware of it? What, what do you know about that act? Okay, that act provided a different framework. Not because of a different learning environment of bilingualism, it, it, it affects uh, child outcomes differently. So it was so easy that we could fit deaf kids into this framework. ASL had already been recognized in a, as a language, but it was not included in this law. So what we see there, and I, what I want to emphasize is it says equal outcomes, not equal opportunity. So if we have uh, someone who's not native English and someone who is, when they come in to an English speaking school, who has better outcomes? People who are already native English speakers. So they both have equal opportunities, but they don't get equal outcomes. And that's what that act really emphasized. That was the, the framework of the law, was that we would have equal outcomes. Okay. So the 70s saw a lot of changes. We saw the proliferation of uh, intentional signing systems where people were trying to invent these systems as a way to teach English to deaf kids visually. Mainstream, uh, the mainstream became more common choice or more common experience for deaf children. And now, in the you know, starting in the 70s, it was who knows LRE, the least restrictive environment? What's the goal of LRE, least restrictive environment? For people in schools to have the best opportunity to learn and reduce barriers, give them more opportunities. 
And yes, this was a huge change from deaf schools to more mainstream educational environments. And if they had interpreters or they don't, you know, there weren't enough teachers and not enough interpreters either. For disabled kids, and I'm not talking about deaf kids, I'm talking about kids with disabilities, this was a big help. They got to go to regular classrooms before they were separated out and didn't get equal education, so it was great for them. But for deaf kids, there's a real argument to be made here, but it was a, a large debate, and I'm not going to venture an opinion, but do deaf kids have socialization? Do they have communication in, in a mainstream classroom? Is it really the least restrictive environment? Those are questions that weren't really asked. A few people really wanted me to show some baby pictures, so that's me in the middle. <laughs> now you know what I look like. I was born in an interesting time. Cochlear implant clinical trials had begun just prior to when I was born. But then when I was two years old, Deaf President Now, DPN happened. So that's a real dichotomy. You know, I was born in the middle of these these forces pulling in two directions. So when you talk to me about my journey, this is really where my journey began, in the middle of this uh, social political struggle. Do deaf people have a right to language? Do deaf people have a right to self-determination? What does it mean to be deaf? That's what I was born into, this complicated, messy context. It was a messy time. So in 1990 or 91, thereabouts, I went into a mainstream school. I was born in Washington, D.C., interestingly enough. And my parents, once they were born, they didn't know I was deaf until I was two. But once they figured that out, what happened? It was a classic mom dropped the pot behind me and I didn't move. <laughs> she said, something's going on here. And so in Washington, D.C., in the middle of DPN, Gallaudet, all these things are there. My parents didn't feel like I could get a good education. At that time, I had a hearing loss. They went and looked at the school there, and, and they, I could speak some, and I had some hearing. I was maybe more hard of hearing, so they didn't feel I fit there. So they looked around D.C., and special education in D.C. at that time for deaf kids was so-so. So they decided to move back to Boston Spa. Boston Spa is where my grandmother lived, and so uh, I went 45 minutes commute each way, every day, to go to a mainstream program in Gilderland School, in, in that school district. So that's where I was. And so the picture in the middle is, these are the people I grew up with. This is, again, when schools for the deaf were considered a more restrictive environment. I think. Um, Today we recognize that deaf kids need more than just access to what the teacher says. But at that time, the social uh, importance, the emotional connection between people or even the ability to uh, participate in extracurricular activities or sports wasn't recognized in the same way. So elementary school, um, cochlear implants at that time became more common. My mom has said to me that if I had been born later I probably would have been implanted but at that time it was still new and they did not feel comfortable um, implanting me so they didn't. So in 1995 cochlear implants were approved for uh, kids age two and over so they, the implant age came down. Middle school. I was an awkward kid with braces. What can I say? Kids in this last picture, the one that I showed before, previously, right. elementary school, we all hung out together, right? But by middle school, something shifted. When I was being an awkward kid with braces, I started to notice something was off about my experience with my friends. Uh -huh. And I couldn't figure out what was going on, and I, I, I was too young to really understand it, but I could see it and recognize it. My mainstream program 
had, you know, a deaf homeroom, and then we would go out to mainstream in other classes and come back to our deaf homeroom. And that was one of the, I, I was one of the few of us who actually went out into those other classes. There were maybe four or five of us. Chris, would you say that's about right? Yeah. Yeah. So the other 20 or 25 of the kids stayed in that room all day in the deaf classroom. So I started to realize they were having a different experience than I was. I was going out to mainstream classes and they were staying there all day and something was off about that, though at that age I didn't know how to describe it or how to think about it. Then my family moved to a new school district so I didn't have to take this long co commute every day. And finally I could be involved after school or be more involved in school in a variety of ways. I was lucky my parents could afford to make that kind of move that gave me more opportunities. But the funny thing is, mainstream is supposed to be the least restrictive environment, but it created a situation where I couldn't even be involved fully in my own education. No ex extracurricular activities until we moved. So this last picture is high school. And that's where I really started to see something was very off between my experiences and the other kids. My deaf peers are, were reading it like a second grade level and doing math and science at a second grade level or a third grade level and I remember seeing their work on the board and it was so simple. The math problems or the science work was elementary. I thought how is this acceptable? I'm in high school. Like, why are they still so, why are they so behind? While I was in high school, cochlear implants became approved for babies 12 months and older. And then I graduated and I came here to RIT. Now, at RIT, I worked with Peter at the Deaf Studies Lab, which was a very rich experience with me. And even in that time, we saw early language experiences were uh, key and we could start to see some of that. And as un undergrads, we hadn't really figured out what was going on at that time, but something was off. We knew something was happening. So, and we knew it was related to language and maybe to education. So I had an interest in this area all throughout my experiences. Part of my group of friends from NTID are in this picture. And not all of them, but you might recognize a few people in there. They, some of them work here now. And why I put this picture up is interesting because when I was here at RIT, that's when I really started to experience a feeling of being included in my whole life. And I started to grow as a human, not just you know being a good student in the classroom, but it made me realize my identity as a deaf person and this was a critical period for me and uh, I was talking with Jerry Buckley last week about the important role of NTID as a safe place for deaf kids who have grown up isolated and they arrive here and it's their time to finally figure out who they are and everything they missed growing up and that was a really powerful experience for me. So I graduated from RIT and I went into the PhD in clinical psych program at Gallaudet. Now the big reason why is because of Peter and his program. He was my first deaf role model really and I had someone to look up to and I said I could be like that so I just followed in his footsteps. So I went into Gallaudet into the clinical psych program and I got to, to, I was able to work under VL2 which is a huge lab there and it would now it was small when I first started but I became uh, uh, involved in this toolkit project as part of VL2 that was doing testing and developing all kinds of uh, products and gathering data about these language experiences so again Focused on language, in this case reading, I'm still interested in language. It's reading, but it's an it was an opportunity for me to also get exposed to research. And I said, oh, that's something I could do. So then I came back here and did my, all clinical psychology programs require a one-year internship, and I came here to the University of Rochester. And that year was fundamental for me. 
I saw a talk given by Dr. Sanjay Gulati. That first slide was a quote from him, from that talk. Language deprivation uh, syndrome was, that terminology was developed by him, at, and he gave a talk at Brown University. I wasn't there, I watched it on a live stream. And his, his talk uh, really focused on what happens to kids when they grow up without language and how it impacts their language later, um, psychologically, and then how we see people in the psychiatric system. And these people have behavior problems, not because they have a mental illness in itself, they're not psychotic, they're not depressed, but their, their life is disordered, disrupted, because they don't have language to express themselves or function. And I suddenly, everything I had seen in my childhood and, and my college experiences all made sense. This is the way that language was connected to it all. And a light bulb went off, it not, practically knocked me off my feet. And that was a powerful lecture for me to be able to see because then I finally had a word to describe what I've been seeing and feeling my whole life, language deprivation. The, that book, The Deaf Mute Howls, talks about not having language affected this guy's brain. But we didn't have a word for it. So it was there. It was there all along. Deaf people knew it. But Dr. Sanjay Gulati gave this term to what I had experienced. So that was powerful. So then I went to University of Massachusetts Medical School. And Dr. Gulati is in uh, Massachusetts. And there's a deaf inpatient unit at the state psychiatric hospital there, and there's only two or three units like that in the whole country. So that year was a clinical year for me, and so I got to work with these people, and I want to talk about this a little bit. This chart is from Black and Glickman. And Neil Glickman is a psychologist in Massachusetts, and he was in that same hospital for many years as the clinical psychologist there. And he saw something happening with deaf people that he didn't see with the hearing patients. The hearing people who were put into an inpatient state psychiatric mental institution were fundamentally different than ma the majority of the deaf people. He saw a language disfluency that didn't exist in hearing people, and he called it, you know, being language disfluent. And anyone who's, you know, has who has disordered language, usually it's from a psychiatric cause, and so they're put, you know, it's a sign of mental illness. It, does that make sense? That's how we know what's happening psychiatrically in somebody's brain is by their language disfluency. So they're put in to places. So these deaf people were put into a psych hospital and they weren't, they had no psychiatric illness, but there was no other place to put them. Who else can deal with them? They aren't able to function in the world. So these people were put away in a mental institution for lack of a better place to put them. So after spending a year with these patients, I started to feel that I, I, I just really had a fundamental question that since language deprivation is so pervasive in a person's life, what can I really do to help these people who are stuck in this? I mean, because these people are going to live with the effects of this for the rest of their lives. So is that what I should be doing with my work life? Or is there a way for me to do something that can actually, you know, prevent people from having these experiences? Because with research, we can show that this is created. So I felt research was really where I could make an impact on the world, but these, these clinical experiences were profound for me. And that's where I really got the fire, seeing the way these people suffered, I really got a fire to do this research work. So that clinical experience, which was a one-year experience, once I finished it, I came back to Rochester. And now I work at the University of Rochester under a grant that's partnered with RIT. And uh, I'm almost, I've just finished one year of that. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what I'm doing in that postdoctoral fellowship in a moment. But I just want to say that 
what we're doing research on now has the possibility to prevent these experiences. So, so now let me dive a little bit into my research. I want to talk a little bit about what the arguments are against sign language today because we still have them. I'm going to talk a little bit about both of these points, but first let me talk about, uh, let's give it a little bit of background. So the critical period for language development, really it, it's the beginning of early development and that critical period is from birth to five. By the, I mean, five isn't a hard number, but it's around five. There's research that people, you know, plasticity lasts a certain amount of time, but it's a, around five. And so that period is critical because the brain is made to receive language. It, it has a natural neuroplasticity, so it's ready to absorb language, whatever language it gets uh, exposed to from the world. And so that exposure creates language structures in the brain. Now, research has shown that later in life, language exposure, it, we don't have that same capacity to absorb langu language in that same way. So now let's look at another quote. Some of you may remember this from last spring. Uh, the president of A.G. Bell wrote this letter to the Washington Post as a response to Niall DeMarco's Dancing with the Stars and his, some of his advocacy. And I, it, it created a lot of drama in the deaf community. And when I read this, it really bothered me. And, and, and I thought, what does she mean by this? Here's what she's saying. She, this is the concept that she believes is true. She thinks that deaf babies need to be implanted and spoken to only, and if that fails, no big deal, because you can learn sign language uh, at a native level, so even if it's later. It's the backup plan. She's th and she said this in her letter. It was published in the Washington Post. So let's uh, put on your science hats now. How would you test that if you're going to research this question? She's made this claim. How would we test that? How would we know if this is true or not? Who would you test? Right, we're not talking about doing anything unethical of denying language to people and then testing them. What we're talking about is testing that's possible in the real world, and some of that has been done. So let me talk about research that's shed some real light on this. You can test deaf people who don't have English skills growing up and they get exposed to sign language much later in life. And this is a study that did just that. Rachel Mayberry is a name that might be some familiar to some of you from UCSD. She did a study about this critical period. So one way to conceptualize this kind of research uh, on the critical period is with deaf people who have a variety of ages of ex initial exposure to sign language. So she did brain imaging, fMRIs, scans of these people's brains while they were watching a video with sign language. And they had real sign language in some of the clips and fake sign language. And the real sign, when you saw real sign language, they would have reaction, they would judge the reaction time of the person's, uh, you know, clicking a button to say, yes, this is real. So then she uh, looked at age of acquisition and you can see from this chart, clearly a later age of acquisition means less fluency, pro a profoundly different result in the level of fluency. This age of acquisition, this initial age of exposure is critical. 
So this means that the critical period for sign language is not different for spoken versus visual language. They're exactly the same. The brain doesn't care what kind of language it is. It just needs language during that period. The modality is, is irrelevant. Any kind of language works for the brain during that critical period. So that's what we learned from, Ray, from Mayberry's study. So let's look at the year that this was done, 2011, 2013, 2011. 2013 was published, it was done in 2011. We know that this is true, but here we are in 2016, just this past spring, people still making these kinds of claims about sign language. That claim is not supported by research. There's no evidence for this statement. And yet, it got published by the Washington Post and a pre the president of the A.G. Bell Association evidently believes that this is true. Now, A.G. Bell's a familiar name to us, of course. So we come back around to where we started. So these principles are still alive in that organization today. Everyone in that organization doesn't necessarily believe everything, well, all these statements here, and I'm not, I'm, I don't want to accuse anybody of that, but these fundamental ideas about sign language being inferior and the need to influence hearing people to deny sign language to deaf people are still there and they're still willing to give misinformation. So that's, that's a big deal. I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole here with the cochlear implant research, but I want to talk about this because these people who support implantation only admit, freely admit and publish that the results are really variable. Some kids do really well, some do not. On average, they look better than maybe if they hadn't been implanted, but within that group of who, are they, who they're looking at, there's a huge variability so some of those are real people with real lives and we want to look at them oh. CI researchers recognize and admit this variability in results and they said well why does this happen and someone came up with an idea that maybe sign language will take over control of the brain structures that are remember that critical period where there we have this extra neuroplasticity where the brain is ready to absorb language and is adaptable at a higher level than it will be later on maybe if it's uh, exposed to uh, sign it will take over the auditory cortex meaning the CI can't be fully effective if sign language is present. So this was a hypothesis that was uh, proposed. So that's why they said, well, don't sign with kids who are implanted because you don't want that visual takeover to happen. So now, put your scientist hat back on. What would you do to test this claim? Who would you test? The one on the left, your left, is a researcher. That research was really about who, who have native signers who have deaf parents who are also implanted compared to people, to kids who are not signing, not exposed to sign language. And who hears better and who speaks better? Who has more uh, intelligible speech? Who can repeat sentences? Those who had sign language did better. This is a very important effect to understand. So cochlear implant outcomes are actually better with sign language. Okay, that's good to know. Now, um, Davidson said, well, let's take another look at that. Okay, these kids sign, they have deaf parents and they get implanted. But they also had hearing siblings 
uh, because one of the ideas here is, you know, now we're comparing bilinguals to bilinguals. So we were ex they were expecting the cochlear implant uh, kids to be a little bit behind in speech. But what we found is that they looked exactly the same. So bilingual to bilingual, they gave them tests of speech, they gave them tests of language, and found that they were exactly the same. Exactly the same. So Reacher said, well, these siblings also have deaf parents, so there's an influence of visual language there. So that's when you know they looked then at the cochlear implant users who didn't have sign language, and we saw that they didn't have the same level of uh, speech that the kids with sign language and cochlear implants had. So native signers with cochlear implants have the best outcome. That's clear evidence that the visual takeover hypothesis is not true. Visual language does not interfere with spoken language development. So what we see is the kids with both do as well as or better. So if you really look at this hypothesis, there's no data to support that. And there's a number of papers that cite that. And these people write papers, all these names I have up here. They cite each other, but it's all in a hypothesis. There's no original data, no data underlying this at all. So where's the proof for this hypothesis? But it's used to justify excluding sign language. And this is, this is the real result. Those two studies are not adequate to really robustly answer this question. It, it isn't enough. We do need more. But it's enough to start to question what's been going on. Does the status quo really justify excluding sign language? Does it justify the exclusion of language that has the ability to interfere over the rest of a person's life? I don't think so. In my feeling about this, language deprivation is at the heart of the, this variability we see in the, cochlear, the kids who are cochlear, have cochlear implants. So no matter how young they are when they're implanted, they've missed some language exposure. So some kids may be able to catch up and others may not. So how can you learn um, a language if you haven't had exposure? So for kids, when they're developing, these critical periods have long-lasting effects. I'm getting a thumbs, two thumbs up from Dr. Scott over here. Last spring, I had a pivotal experience. I went to see Noam Chomsky give a talk at the University of Rochester. Do, do people know who Chomsky is? He is a very famous linguist from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's the father of modern linguistics and the creator of the concept of universal grammar. So he was invited by the University of Rochester to come and give a talk. He's this little old guy. And he got up, gave his talk. And one thing that he said had a profound impact on me. And I, it connected everything else I knew in a fundamental way. He said, language is not for communication. Language is fundamental to the human being for development of cognition, for cognitive development. We can't even think without it. And once he made that connection for me, I thought about deaf education and this idea of interfering with kids' ability to speak. Because what happens in deaf ed is they put communication before cognition. How can we make the kids speak? How can we make them understand spoken English? How can we make them read English? And they put communication first. Now, of course, communication is important across a lifespan. But when we think about healthy development, I don't know that it comes first. What happens when we put communication before cognition? 
How does it affect a person's life? We see these really variable results, and that's happened across time. Deaf education has a huge concern about second language acquisition and how it's going to happen and whether grammar will be disrupted. But what we see here with deaf kids often is language deprivation is what interferes with the second language acquisition and the internalization of grammar. And that makes sense. If you don't have fully uh, formed first language, a native language, how can you acquire a second language? It also affects brain structures as well. Gray matter is affected. Gray matter is necessary for speed and efficiency of processing. So the less gray matter you have, the less efficient you are. So when you're sitting in a classroom taking in information, trying to make sense of what's coming at you, and you have less, less gray matter to work with, you, you can't be as efficient. And the more behind you get, the more behind you get. It has a cumulative effect. And that cumulative effect continues across the lifespan. We need to reframe deaf child development. This is clear. Deaf people have known for a long time what's best for deaf kids. We know it. We've lived it. It's our experience. It's intuitive. It may not be validated by the hearing world or research yet, but we know it. And our experiences have often been invalidated. And people who are doing research are often not asking the right questions. But if you're not part of shaping history, as we've seen, that history will shape us. So I was shaped by everything that happened in deaf education before I was born into my journey. So if you can become part of shaping history going forward, you can make a better life for deaf people who come after us. So start asking those questions. What are those, what are those questions? What are the things in your life that you say, how did this happen to me? Because those experiences are the real richness that we have to bring to research. All the things that, that uh, I lived through that I knew but didn't know how to talk about have led me to my research questions and this is what I'm doing now. There are a couple of ways of conducting research. One is called qualitative where you're talking to people. Another is quantitative, where you're measuring things with numbers, a variety of different kinds of things. And I've really struggled with, how, where do I start my research on this topic? Where does langu language de deprivation come from? And do we all agree what it looks like? Wh how are people defining it? And what does it look like in different people? So I was fortunate to um, get hooked up with a guy named Tim Dye at the University of Rochester, who is a uh, a long time, very successful researcher, and when I started to tell him about these experiences, he said, you need to go back out into the community and talk with deaf people about their experiences because that, those experiences, that what intuitively, what we know about our own lives is the starting point. It should be the foundation of a research career. And then I can do quantitative and ask some, some good questions, but the, the knowledge and wisdom from the community is the place to start. That's the process that can be validated. And you know, I have my own intuitive sense as a deaf person, but I'm only one person. So my next stage of my development as a researcher is to go into the community and bring everyone, you know, the wisdom, the collective wisdom of the deaf community as the starting point for my research. And then I will get to quantitative over time. But I'm working on my qualitative skills right now. So it's interesting, there's another person at the University of Rochester who, um, uh, is named Ann Dozier. She's the head of the Public Health Services Division, and she said, that sounds like an ACE. An, a, an ACE is an adverse childhood experience. And what it means is kids who grow up with trauma or seeing abuse or living in a war zone or something really negative that's affected them adversely. 
So there's a lot of research about ACEs, and for kids who even have one of these negative experiences, it can affect their health outcomes for the rest of their life. The, and not only health, but their employment, vocationally, all kinds of things. So that frame can be useful for explaining these long-term effects of language deprivation. Is language deprivation an adverse childhood experience, or is it a confounding um, experience for other ACEs? What does it look like? At NCDHR, the National Center for Deaf Health Research, they've done a survey and they've asked questions regarding ACEs. So fortunately, we have some data there. And so we can look at that and I'm working on that to build on what they've done. And is language deprivation an ACE? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Now, the dinner table syndrome, I usually don't have to explain that to deaf people because you know it's a common experience in your families if you have hearing families. So in the Deaf Health Survey, again, they asked about hearing status and then reports of how often you understood your family's indirect communication, so communication with each other, not direct to the person answering it, but they're, you know, the family talking to each other. So this is incidental learning. So they're talking about paying the mortgage or grandma being sick or something like that. So comparing those two data points, deaf, deaf People who had deaf parents 80% of the time understood indirect communication. Those with hearing, uh, hearing parents said 80% of the time they didn't understand I incidental information. So uh, Scott Smith and I have been working, uh, and his work is in health literacy, taking that information and how it affects who we are, like how I know things about my health or my family history or, or all kinds of things like that. So we're trying to connect this intuitive knowing with what we see in life outcomes. So we see these things, but we don't have this connection. And a lot of the cochlear implant research goes up to five, six, or seven, and then it's not really concerned with deaf kids after that. But when they're 20, when they're 30, when they're 40, when they're 50, do they have a happy life? Are they healthy? How is that for them? There's no documentation. So this is my passion, connecting these health outcomes with these early language experiences. And, you know, from what I know, many deaf people aren't able to live up to their potential because there's a profound barrier in place. And I think we know that sign language gives people an opportunity that isn't there without it. We have a chance to interact with the world in a richer, more complex way. So, in a nutshell, that's my work.